It is the end of an era. Jason Kelsey announcing his retirement today. So it's fitting that we uh, start the week off on the football lounge here with that news. Obviously, Mark, uh, storied career for him. He's a Super Bowl champion. Been to another as well. One of the best centers we've ever seen personally um, and probably just one of the best centers in the history of the league you know, to begin with, obviously a long career, one of the most, you know, athletic centers ever too. that guy pulled all the time. So yeah, just your reaction. I mean, for anyone who, you know, watches uh, casually even probably knows of Jason Kelsey, because obviously not only being Travis Kelsey's brother, but he has, you know, had quite a footing in social media as well, him and his wife, Kylie, and they've been out, out and about, you know, bringing their lives, uh, you know, public, for a lot of people. So we saw it coming. Uh, I know they've had the documentary and things like that. And he had alluded to, you know, been thinking about retirement for a couple of years. So it doesn't come as much of a surprise, but your general thoughts here uh, as we are officially, you know, approaching a new era of an Eagle center, which hasn't been for about 13 years or so. My first thoughts are, you know, like ESPN, Fox sports, CBS, throw the bag at him. He yeah, is no kidding. He's electric. He's great to watch. He's great to listen to. He's, um, you know, you could, if you put the right team around him, he's someone like you could build your pregame show around for the next like decade to come. You know, Fox has already got Gronk in there and kind of like, you know, starting the next generation of, if you see Terry starting to wind down, Jimmy starting to wind down, any, a guy like Jason Kelsey, uh, could certainly, you know, be the future replacement for a, for a Howie long. And you, you build, you try to keep building that crew and, and people like that. He's, he's great. So I'd love to see that. My, that's my first, first thought. My next thought is, you know, obviously thinking about his career, he's great. He was one, you're right. I mean, he's, he's in our lifetimes of watching football since really religiously since about the t- year 2000. I think you'd have to make the argument. He's probably the best center in our lifetimes. Uh, and there's been some really good ones. Kevin Mawai, uh, Olin Krutz, uh names come to mind in the early two yeah. thousands. Alex and Mack, Sean Alex Vera. Mack, yeah, yeah, that's a great one as Saturday well. Saturday was really good. Jeff Saturday, very good center. Um, and and you know Kelsey, now he's kind of built this brand bigger, larger than life. And you know he's the type of guy that you like. You, you just root for him because you hope now he's leaving the game at the right time where he's accomplished everything he he really could. Besides that Super Bowl, uh, that second Super Bowl ring. And he gets to, you know, he gets to still hopefully be able to, you know, not have a million surgeries in five years from now. Uh, and is the, the you know, the man behind the tush push and uh, so many iconic moments uh, for that franchise. And it's there's something special about a guy starting and ending the career in one place. And we're going to talk about that coming up with the big story line with Mike Evans breaking this morning. Um, so happy for him, happy for his family, pumped for the guy and uh, – Next stop, Canton. Absolutely. Hopefully with some, you know, actual on-screen time with a Fox or an ESPN or a CBS uh, and uh, and really, you know, lightening up. You know, he he would he would bring a lot of like uh, fun to that CBS pregame show that's kind of boring. Oh, yeah. And and he would bring a lot of uh, entertainment to like a Monday night football or a or a Sunday night football crew as well. Or I think he'd be a great fit with the Fox guys for sure. No, it's all about a personality, and he's certainly one that you know brings it to the forefront. And it's one thing to have a personality. You know, I would argue Steve Smith has certainly a lot of personality. I don't think it translates very well to the you know visual broadcast analyst thing. So there is that side of it too. I think Jason Kelsey has the total package. So I agree with you that uh, if you're any of those networks. Go get him. Yeah, yeah, do whatever you can to go get that guy because, um, you know, we're starting to get that new wave of former athletes in there, and and he would certainly be among the best to do it. Um, But that kind of springboards us into, you know, the end of an era for uh, Jason Kelsey, but the beginning of an era for a lot of the pending free agents here in the NFL ahead of the 2024 NFL season. Free agency officially beginning next week, so we have a week before any of those moves can be made. But as we saw today with the big news of Mike Evans dropping, uh, that people can't sign their their players right now uh, before they hit free agency uh, if they so choose and if they're able to work out a deal. But obviously, there's going to be a lot of decisions to make about what teams are going to be doing, if they're going to let guys walk, potentially get compensatory picks because of it, or 
if they're going to try and work out long-term extensions with those guys. It always takes two to tango. So let's launch ourselves here into the free agency frenzy that begins next week, but we're going to preview it here today. So the big thing, as you notice there, is we're going to discuss landing spots. What is best uh, for a lot of these players and uh, the potential teams that they could end up with? What's the best pairing? What's the best marriage uh, in this free agent class? And uh, for a lot of the guys, maybe it's with their current team that yeah. they're with right now. Uh, I'm sure that's going to be the case for several of them. But we've kind of whittled it down to a list of about, I don't know, 9, 10, 11 players that we'll discuss here. The list is much, much larger uh, than than we could ever you know dream to incorporate into an episode <laughs> or even five. But we'll want to talk about where possibly key. Deontay Foreman ends up. You know the third string <laughs> running back for the Bears. Yeah, we could do. We we don't have to go into that. Exactly. I mean, I was like uh, almost ready to joke about the uh, the combine that we watched this past week and how we're yeah. going to break down each individual combine <laughs> performance. Mark, your yeah. thoughts on the uh, the Iowa Hawkeyes defensive lineman Logan Lee's three cone. <laughs> Can you give us a, a breakdown of, of that? <laughs> no, uh, I you don't want you don't want my breakdown of that. But it is you know we'll have this is kind of that fun show where you get a little bit of the preview, some of the bigger names versus then we'll have plenty of time to react to where guys actually do sign uh, over yeah. the next couple of weeks and and everything. But this is our our chance to kind of tell you what our thoughts are for like you know team needs and and really. Not just because the team needs a running back doesn't mean Derrick Henry's going to be a fit for you and your and your franchise. So uh, that's kind of what this episode's about. Absolutely, and you know, last year we did a big episode on the running back market and kind of how it's deteriorated. Yeah, over we're talking the years. about a lot of those guys again. Yeah, because you know we were talking about the the franchise tags and you know what some of these top end running backs are going to you know garner. Uh, Saquon obviously got himself a nice little deal. Uh, you know, Josh Jacobs came back with the Raiders, but those, both those guys are back in the pool again. And we've got guys like Derrick Henry as well. So some big names in this free agent class, and that's just the yeah. running backs we're talking about. We've got wide receivers, some great defensive players, quarterbacks. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll get into that in just a moment, but kind of launching us into that discussion is going to be obviously the news of Mike Evans that also broke today. Yeah. Uh, he and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have agreed on a two year extension. So it's a shorter term deal. He's 30 years old, going to be 31, uh, later this year, but 30 years old, a two year, $52 million extension with 35 million of it guaranteed a huge get for obviously a wide receiver that deserves it because He's the only wide receiver in NFL history to post 10 straight 1,000 yard seasons. And in fact, the second, uh, you know, most uh, consecutive seasons is six. So he's done it four more seasons than the closest uh, wide receiver. So that just shows how uh, reliable he's been in his career, how consistent he's been with some lesser than stellar quarterback play. We think of Jameis Winston was there and, you know, some backups obviously he had Tom Brady and then. Baker Mayfield most recently this past season, but the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, despite having a, a relatively older team, a team that's kind of in that, you know, middle ground, not really sure if they were going to pony up for, you know, an aging player, but they're making it clear, like he's the guy that they're going to ride with. They want to make him a Tampa Bay Buck, hopefully for life and, uh, and kind of solidify his spot there. And I think they know too, Mark, that this was the best move for them. If they want to remain where they're at and take us some steps forward. Baker Mayfield had a really good season and that doesn't happen without Mike Evans. So keeping that consistency for Baker Mayfield there is probably, I would think one of the driving motivations for getting this deal done and, and making sure it gets mm -hmm. done before free agency gets, gets here and gets out of hand. Yeah. I would a hundred percent expect the next news that we see out of Tampa is Baker Mayfield and them agree to either the franchise tag or a two year deal which looks very similar to match, you know, kind of Mike Evans's deal in the sense that, hey, we kind of caught lightning in a bottle last year and surprisingly won this uh, division. And so now can we turn this into a little bit of a run here? You know, with Tom Brady, if you extend this era since Tom Brady arrived, now the Bucs have been one of the most consistent teams in football now in, in, over this kind of past four-year run. And it's wild, That's you know, true. Super Bowl yeah. victory, 
some playoff wins, uh, you know, and, and uh, now divisional wins again, you know, winning a division again when we thought they were going to kind of plummet. And so Mike Evans is a huge part of that. Mike Evans will go down, uh, if especially if he if he plays even to like the level he did this year, with even a slight drop off the next two years as one of definitely the top 10 wide receivers of all time, first ballot Hall of Famer. Again, I think there's something special to probably just playing 12 straight years with one team, winning a Super Bowl, being a part of that, and then also Bart being a part of some really lean years, but also uh, some uh, really kind of surprising years, like this one with, uh, that he had with Baker Mayfield. So if you're the Bucks at this point in time, you're kind of stuck, right? Like you had you had two options after Brady left. One was completely blow it up, and the other was to try to patchwork this kind of veteran team and stick together. They went with the patchwork, which I think we both kind of thought was the wrong play, and they proved us wrong by winning the division. Now, do we think the Bucs are going to be a Super Bowl contender last year, this year, next year? No, probably not. But they're absolutely the threat to win their division again. And in the NFC, if an injury breaks your way, they were in that game against the Lions in that first half. Like, who knows what could happen uh, that you can you can put together a really nice season without winning the Super Bowl and prove that your organization is turning around. Like, the Bucs don't feel, to me, like lovable losers anymore. They feel yeah. like after the moves they make and, and re-signing Mike Evans and keeping him a buck for life and patchworking this thing together, it feels like this is an organization now that's making really sound decisions and is just trying to continue that culture of, hey, we want to win here. This is, we want to win Super Bowls, but we also just want to win. And yeah, there's exactly. a lot of organizations I wish would just take that lead and follow that direction because it's it's healthier for your franchise. It's healthier for your fan base. It's healthier for your free agency. It's just healthier in general if you just have a culture of winning it, guys who can come in and out and know how to win. Mike Evans has been a crucial part of that over the last six years especially. Now, happy for him, and I fully expect them to tie Baker for, with Mike for the next two years so they can help. At least, if, if anything, Baker will just help Mike Evans make sure if he's healthy, puts up the numbers to pad his Hall of Fame resume for sure over the next two years. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head with with their approach to winning and and how they have turned over a new leaf because they could have easily bottomed out entirely oh, yeah. and been we back in that them. terrible spot that a lot of teams don't want to be uh, for a very long time. Uh, we've seen in the past, you know, not every not every team can rebound and rebuild very quickly, and so there's always a danger to that. But they've been able to maintain and um, and stay relevant. So good for Mike Evans; he gets yeah. his bag. He's one of those receivers that doesn't get enough credit. I mean, it, it mainly because he's in kind of that division that's just not very terribly competitive, and we don't see a whole lot from them on national yeah. TV. And um, but Mike Evans, I mean, he's he's still right now performing among the best in the league. And you know, we've gotten more and more elite talent coming out of college, so there's been more and more great wide receivers in the league to contend with. But he has still remained in that top 10 conversation, you know, year in and year I think out. Part of it is that we always waited for them when things weren't going well with Jameis and uh, to like, all right, they'll trade Mike Evans. They're going to blow yeah. this thing up, get him to a winning team. But he never demanded a trade, never been a diva, just every year puts up a thousand yards. And then he got the shine with Brady and he was Brady's go-to guy, won a Super Bowl with Brady, put up big game, big numbers in big games with Tom and, and, you know, in and, and the biggest moments. And then, you know, you expect, all right, trade him again, get him to a, get him to a Kansas City, get him to somewhere where he can go and wind out his Hall of Fame career with some more wins. And all he did was show up this year, put up a thousand yards and help lead them to yeah, another playoff, uh, another playoff appearance and victory. So kudos to him. I think he, we now are appreciating him appropriately. You yeah. know, is he as great as Julio Jones in his prime? A guy who's, you know, their careers mirrored each other. No, probably not. Like peak Julio is better than peak Mike Evans. Yeah. Peak Megatron better than peak Mike Evans, but longevity consistency. He reminds me a lot of Andre Johnson, who's just going into the hall of fame where or it's kind of like, or, you know, never Obviously really, position. yeah, never really a diva kind of like always thought they should probably just get to a bigger market and cause they'd be a bigger star, but, did nothing but put up like a Brian Urlacher in a lot of ways. Like, dude, just 
was maybe out, overshadowed by a guy that you could argue was better. You know what I mean? I could push and pull on that, like who is actually better, but was just more of like the lunch pail, hard hat, went to work every day with one team for 12 straight years it'll be, and just constantly put up insane numbers. And if he retires after two years, it'll most likely will be he still put up a thousand yards and probably could still go, but it's just like, all right, I'm done. You know, unlike Julio yep. Jones now that has bounced around from Tennessee to Philly to, to yeah. Tampa and just kind of like yeah. had a weird end to his career. Yeah, that was bizarre for Julio. Um, all right. Well, looking into the free agent class, then we'll get into a lot of these guys yeah, again. Let's do it. Next week is when it starts. So that's when teams like are are actually allowed to, uh, you know, uh, discuss acquisitions and uh and and details with the agents and all of that stuff so it's a long drawn drawn out period but we can expect to to see some fireworks on display we'll start with kirk cousins because he is available uh on the free agent market a lot of speculation as to whether or not he's going to return back to minnesota obviously yeah. that connection he has with kevin o'connell does seem to be a good one it's worked well you know kirk is one of those guys we've talked about it year in and year out super consistent you know, above average quarterback who you can win games with. Totally. Obviously, he hasn't gotten them over the hump and, and had these, uh, you know, success in the postseason, which is going to be, you know, the the black spot on his career to this point. But a guy that's really solid and can take a lot of those average teams and elevate them a little bit, especially teams with good weapons at their disposal. So, uh, do, do you think that his best spot and, and by the way, for this discussion, I think it's best if we don't get into the nitty gritty of what teams have the cap space to afford these guys, because the, at the end of the day, these yeah. teams can do a lot of reworking with their contracts to make room if they really did want to make a push. There's some teams obviously that won't be able to afford yeah. no matter what, but the, the teams we'll be talking about, uh, could theoretically find a way uh, to to make room and, and get money. They're very creative nowadays with how they do contracts. So like putting all of that aside, just thinking about best fits and what would make sense and teams that are quarterback needy. Is it a trip back to Minnesota or is it going off to something like the NFC South and competing and being the best quarterback there? Or, you know, going to a, a, a Vegas and, and trying to, uh, you know, compete against the Mahomes and others in that division. I mean, what wh where do you see the best possible scenario for Kirk, and then is it the best possible scenario for Minnesota as well? I think the best scenario is for Kirk to just go back to Minnesota. And if you're Minnesota, I think you should look to do it anyways. You know, Minnesota is in that kind of weird spot in the draft. I believe they're around number 12, if I have that right. And as I quickly, ba -ba 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 -ba, bad radio. Yeah, no, they're number 11 here in the draft order. And I think um, for me, if you're Minnesota, you need a quarterback for next year. Kirk is available. Kirk is endorsed by your star wide receiver. Kirk already has a, a relationship with your now going to be second year wide receiver, Jordan Addison. So he's got the connection with all of your weapons. He's got the connection with your head coach. You tr obviously you're trying to improve your roster. Minnesota is not the type of team right now that can give up all their picks to go get a quarterback. They, they need to help flush out this roster. They need to, get more picks, honestly. So if you're Minnesota, I think the smartest thing you can do is you re-sign Kirk Cousins to a two-year deal that's heavily front-loaded. It basically can be like a get-out-after-one-year type of deal for you and Kirk. But if you want to keep him for two, you make it work. And and you can then draft a quarterback in the, at that 11 spot or in the second round if someone's falling um, and that, that way you have Kirk and you just say anyone that is going to be out of that top five region, a lot of those guys I think would benefit from sitting for a year or two years anyways. And I think if you have Kirk, Minnesota fans and Vikings fans, uh, they're going to be able to just say, Hey, we'll run, we'll run it a year with Kirk and let someone sit and learn behind Kirk, uh, and go that way. If I was Kirk, the only other places I would test the waters for if they were really throwing the bag at me, willing to give more money than Minnesota and really maybe like a longer deal would be teams in the NFC. I would avoid the AFC like the plague. I think he's smart enough to know I don't want to go and put myself on a Raiders team 
you know what I mean, on a Patriots team where you're the fourth, you're you're definitely the fourth in your division. You're going up against, you know, every single team as an all pro or a stud young quarterback. So I would look to then the NFC South as a possibility. Can I get my way to Atlanta? Can I get my way to the Bucks if they move on from Baker Mayfield? Like those are really solid options. Or maybe, just maybe, Washington. If Washington yeah. was back. willing, if Washington was willing to go that route, I don't think Washington should. I think Washington should, you know, Drake May, Jane Daniels, or trading up for uh, for um, Caleb Williams is definitely the way Washington should go. Uh, but if I was Kirk, I would listen to those things. But why move your home? Why move your family? You spend two more years in Minnesota on a deal, helping like kind of get a rookie quarterback along. Then you know you retire or you walk off into the sunset. You made more money almost than anyone who's ever played the position, and and you're happy about it. Yeah, I think his career earnings, which are I think two hundred thirty million dollars uh, to this point, are uh, uh, in the top fifteen all time earnings in the NFL, uh, regardless of position. So very. And he impressive. could get seventy million guaranteed with Easily. a two year deal. Yeah. Yep. And and he's probably worth it too. That's the thing is that it's the hard decision. A lot thirty five million dollars for Kirk Cousins right now is a bargain. I mean, you're paying yeah. Dak forty five. I mean, I mean fifty million. It's crazy. Yeah. No, yeah, and he's got he gives you the same production. Absolutely, no. A reunion with Washington certainly would be in play, even if they're they're going to go get a, a Drake May. Maybe there's a, a possibility where Washington wants to take the route of letting their quarterback you know, sit behind a Kirk Cousins and learn from him for a year, yeah. you know? And I mean, that's certainly, that's a possible route you could go. It's a lot of capital and you want to get these guys experience, but I do feel not to shift away from this conversation too much. I do feel that sooner rather than later, the NFL is going to start to have that pendulum swing backwards. We've had a lot the last five, six, seven years of quarterbacks playing really early uh, in their rookie year. And I think we're seeing that it's worked at a, about a 50% clip. And I'm thinking that a lot of teams are going to start to implement again, going back with the route of letting them learn because we've seen it work for green Bay. Now two consecutive quarterbacks in a row um, work for Kansas for city years work it's for Kansas, for Kansas city, city and Mahomes. And so, you know, there's obviously a blueprint for success in multiple ways, uh, but that's possible that you could take a quarterback of the top five picks yeah. and still plan on having them sit for a year or even two. Yeah, uh, before throwing them out there. But yeah, Kirk Cousins, I agree. Minnesota's the spot. Uh, it's the best chance to maybe have success now. But I, I I agree with you. I think the Falcons are the one team where he has the most chance at success because Washington, you're still going to have to compete with uh, Dallas, with Philly. Um, and I just don't know how ready that team would be even with a Kirk Cousins at quarterback, whereas yeah. you put him in Atlanta – Yes, their defense has struggled, but they just bring in Raheem Morris, who you'd think you know maybe can have a quick turnaround with that defense. And he's got so many weapons there, playing in a dome just like he does in Minnesota. So not much of a transition there. Uh, and and the easier division and division is uh, yeah. is is much less. So I think that would be a really good landing spot for him. But Minnesota, for the both of us, seems to be the top spot. Let's talk about Josh Jacobs. Obviously, a really good career so far at the running back position. That position has been devalued year over year over year. Uh, where we're seeing undrafted players routinely having success, uh, depending on the system. But obviously, Jacobs is one of those rare guys that's like just really talented, really uh, solid, and uh, and he's been consistent and has shown that he could be a star at times in this league. It it seems, Mark, that Vegas is probably ready to move on from him. I would be surprised if Vegas, you know, goes and tries to. They, they just have a lot more that they need to address, and I think they have Zamir White. Uh, who is a talented running back. And, you know, we've talked about it. You can find some guys in the draft and just build it up that way. They've got more issues to kind of uh, address right now. And I think best for Josh Jacobs would be uh, to move on uh, to a team that's more ready to just win now. Yeah. Uh, I think there could be a lot of candidates for that. And now we're moving away from really the true only, you know, one running back in your system type of guy. So could Jacobs be part, part of a dual backfield? That's certainly possible. Um, I could see Philadelphia being a really attractive landing spot for him, despite, you know, they didn't spend that much money to get DeAndre Swift there, to get Rashad Penny. Swift certainly had a good season. And Swift's a free agent half. now. 
uh, and, and he's back in the pool. So do they bring him back? I'm not sure. But if they're planning on only going with Rashad Penny, Penny and Kenneth Gainwell, uh, it can work. Uh, but I think Josh Jacobs would fit what they do there really well. And, and that could be an interesting landing spot for him. There's quite a few others, I think. Uh, but that's one that kind of jumped out to me yeah. uh, right off the bat. So for me, my gut tells me if I'm a, if I'm a GM right now and I'm evaluating all of the available running backs, which we've been told they could still be tagged. There's the last minute possibility of a tag here. Today's the final or tomorrow's the final day for tags. But you, in, in my opinion, Josh Jacobs and Swift are the only two running backs I'd be really looking at giving like a three-year deal to. They're both 26, 27. So they're kind of in the middle of their prime. Maybe, you know, a three-year deal by year three, it's a little depending on the injuries. But they're both, to me, Swift and Jacobs, three down backs who are capable of doing everything you want a running back to do, blocking, tackling, running, catching, you know, all the, all the you know, they have all the tools uh, that would be worthy of a, of a, like a full three-year deal. A lot of other guys, Henry, Saquon, um, you know, A.J. Dillon is going to be a free agent. Like, two-year deals feels right. You know, like a David Montgomery, yep. two-year, 10 a million a piece. I can live with that. And, you know, can I get squeeze all the juice out of you for two more years? So, that being said, I would try to bring him back if I'm the Raiders. You're trying to compete in a division with a – Chargers team that we fully expect to be way more buttoned up and way more uh, uh, efficient next year. And a, a two-time Super Bowl defending champion, Kansas City Chiefs. You want as many weapons as you can have. And Josh Jacobs is still a really great weapon. But if they're not willing to do the three-year deal and they're just ready for out of a clean slate, if I'm Josh Jacobs, I have another NFC East team in mind, and that is one where you could put a star on his helmet mm. and be a star in Dallas. Dallas loves stars. They love to sign uh, free agents, spend money on just the running back position. Josh Jacobs, I think, is the premier back available right now. Again, that you'd give a three-year deal to, three years, $13 million, $14 million a, a, a year to. Uh, Jerry Jones loves the sound of that. And if they're going to re-sign Dak and spend big money on Dak, giving him a true three-down back again, unlike Tony Pollard, who's about to hit a free agency, is definitely the way to go to support Dak. He plays better when he has a real, absolute stud, three-down running back. And Josh Jacobs is the best one available, in my opinion, in free agency. That's the only one that get, kind of gives me pause with Dallas because my thought is uh, Josh Jacobs and all of these running backs that we're going to be talking about here are better than Tony Pollard. But Tony Pollard is, is pretty decent. He's a good running back, I'd say. Um, he's not spectacular. He's not you know, overly special in the realm of the, you know, his contemporaries. But if you're Dallas and you're, and you're willing to let him walk only to just basically spend more money to replace him with a slightly better, or, you know, even maybe substantially better uh, player at the position. Um, I don't know. It just, it, it doesn't, it, it seems like they'd be better suited to spend that money elsewhere, especially on the defensive side. Um, it's fair. I, will, I just I, don't, you know, I push point, back a little point. in the sense that I agree that Dallas loves to spend money on their own. Like Dallas loves to reward their own guys yeah. and Jerry loves that. But I also think Jerry loves, you know, a star and a big game hunting and look what I did this off season. I went and got the best back. Um, now they certainly could. I would, I agree with you. They would, it would make sense for them to just draft a running back, go get a Blake Corum or someone like, and just really like, you know, build that offense again, from the running game position up. Uh, but I think um, I think Dallas also, they had such an embarrassing exit in, in the postseason, and they were so yeah. overwhelmed offensively. And Dak looked so overwhelmed. It, it would make, if I'm Josh Jacobs, I'd love to be in Dallas, the star on the helmet, the money that would come along with that, the exposure. And um, I think you also, if you're Dallas, you're the coaching staff, you could justify to Jerry, spend the money. We need to help Dak. So, it's kind of my dream location, friend. It'd be a great talking point for us throughout the season. Josh Jacobs in Dallas. As we move on to Saquon Barkley and talk about his debt landing spots, I yep. will pose one more landing spot for Josh Jacobs because it's the spot that I think would be really good for both him 
uh, or Saquon Barkley here. And that is the Minnesota Vikings, who I just noticed on Twitter here officially announced that they have released Alexander Madison. So they're really down to Ty Chandler as their one running back. Yeah. And, you know, he did play well at the end of the year. He got a lot more playing time. Madison was hurt and uh, Chandler, you know, worked out well. I don't know if they consider him a full three down back. And so they're going to want to bring more into that room. Now, whether they do that through the draft or free agency is yet to totally. be known. But I mean, we talk about Kirk Cousins going back to Minnesota. Yes, they need a lot of help on defense. But if you want to, you know, further surround him with some talent here, you know, he had his best years. They they definitely took a step back in the running back department last year, and they struggled to run the football effectively without Dalvin Cook. You bring in a Saquon Barkley here or a Josh Jacobs, takes the pressure a little bit off of Kirk. You're able to maybe elongate drives and, and kind of make up for the lack on defense a little bit when you can get that run game going. And I think either one of these guys would be a good fit there. But, uh, you know, in terms of New York, Saquon always, he just feels like a giant. And it feels like such a great, um, you know, fit. But I just, over the years, there's just been this tension between these two parties, right? And Saquon is such a unique talent that it's kind of like Bo Jackson, where it's like any moment he could have just, he's so extremely athletic that he could have an injury because of how athletic he is, right? Yeah, how Bo way. Jackson went out. Like most guys would have fallen on that tackle, but he was so strong that he powered through and almost broke out of this arm tackle only to just basically separate his leg from his hip. Um, and, and it's Saquon's that type of build, right? Um, and so you want to be able to maximize his talent when you can. And it's just not going to happen in New York for Saquon in terms of winning. Like it's just, they're, they're still a ways away. I feel even yeah. with Brian Dable there and they've got, you know, quarterback locked up for a lot of money. Saquon would probably be best to just kind of wipe his hands clean of New York and, and, and get a fresh start somewhere else, primarily a contender. And that's, that's the hard thing is, is finding one, you know, that, that has a legitimate chance at, at, at breaking through and, making a deep postseason run, making a Super Bowl. But, you know, there are certainly those teams out there. And I don't know how Tampa feels about Rashad White. Um, but, man, Saquon would be great in Tampa. Um, you know, I could think of, gosh, you know, it wouldn't be great for Saquon, but Carolina could sure, could sure use, a you know, a star running back to help uh, ease things on Bryce Young. So uh, there's a lot of places that Saquon could fit, I believe. Um, but. Do you have like a spot in mind that, that really sticks out? Well, there's a ton. I agree with you. There's a ton. I mean, Minnesota, Dallas, we just said it. Staying in New York. I mean, they need him. They need, you need to make Daniel Jones work. He works better if he has Saquon Barkley. Uh, the Rams. I think the Rams would be a great destination for Saquon to land. Uh, a competitive team that Sean McVay could absolutely get the most out of Saquon Barkley with that young, improving offensive line that the Rams have put together. You know, L.A., stardom, big name. But I have one destination I really want to see Saquon Barkley land, and I think it's a place that no matter where they go with quarterback, they're going to be in a you need to support, you need to win now. I love it. Bear down. I, know where you're I think going. Saquon there you go. Barkley on a, on, in a two-year deal with the Chicago Bears, again, front-loaded, heavy, just as a lot of like a one-year thing. Listen, Khalil Herbert is a, is a fine back for the Bears. The rookie, Roshan Johnson, I think has some real spark moments. But those two guys are are, are guys you absolutely They're want. They want to compliment a guy like Saquon. And if Saquon misses a couple games because he tweaks something because he is a guy who's known to get injured, they absolutely can start a game or two and, and be very, very efficient running the ball. The Bears were the second-best running football uh, team in football last year behind only the Ravens. Uh, ahead of the San Francisco 49ers, Saquon and his agent are going to know that. Going from New York to Chicago, big market. They're going to know that. He knows the, the the branding with the Bears, with Walter Payton, Gail Sayers, running the football defense. They're going to know that, too. It all works in the Saquon kind of legacy. He also knows that if he's going with Justin Fields, him and Justin Fields, DJ Moore, like, that's sick. If he's going there to support the young rookie, Caleb Williams, he knows he's going to get a good workload because they're going to want to take the pressure off of Caleb and make this – Sing easy for him. He also fits really well in the Shane Waldron system. So I'm going to make the case for Saquon to Chicago for all of those reasons is like the kind of best fit, dream fit. But he could go anywhere. He could go anywhere 
Uh, a lot. There's there's two or three other places I could list, um, but I, I really think Saquon is a a unique guy. The problem is if your team is looking to get Saquon, you really just want to do a two year deal. You don't want to be tied to three. He's going to probably want the three because he's only 27. I just would have a hard time pulling the trigger on a three year deal with Saquon because that last year feels like you're screwed. Like you're you are as an organization going to have to cut him or do something. But if you're that desperate to win next year, you might give him the three-year deal just to get him into your building so you can win next year. Uh, we'll see what what kind of offers are on the table for Saquon. But I think Dallas, Chicago are the two that uh, if I was Saquon and I was those organizations, I would try to really make work. You know what? I As you were talking, uh, Hugh, what about Houston? I mean, Houston kind of would check both boxes. They I, they have the yeah. the available money to spend. They have a need at that position, and and they obviously totally. had a, a great offense last year. And they're in a position where they can win now. So Saquon would go there, saying, you know, we I can actually build something here in Houston, and um and and that seems like a, a market he would fit well in. We're talking about an AFC South with some great running backs already: uh, Jonathan Taylor, Travis Etienne. Uh, in that same division, Derrick Henry on his way out. We'll see if he comes back. Um, but that brings us to Derrick Henry. Are the same same spots for him, or, or do you view? No, no, no. Maybe a, I have a, one a spot list. in mind and right. one spot, and it makes it to me. It's the only one that makes a hundred percent sense for him and the team. Again, so thinking win now mode. Probably a two year deal, but really it's like a a win now one year big deal. A team that just breeds physicality. And a team that is committed to running the football, and that's the Baltimore Ravens. Like, and Derrick Henry, yeah. even though he is 30, he's been a very healthy back in his career. And the problem with the Baltimore Ravens is they can't keep anyone healthy. Yeah, that's so and funny. I think the Ravens absolutely need yeah. to draft a running back or two, you know what I mean, in the you know fourth and fifth round, just get guys into camp. But if you give Derrick Henry a two-year deal that's really a big one-year front-loaded deal, him and Lamar Jackson, I mean, think about in the fourth quarter, as a defense, having to have already done 12, 15, 20 carries with Derrick Henry, middle of the fourth quarter, you're getting beat up. And then all of a sudden you got to go tackle Lamar Jackson in space. You're like, you're done. You're toast. Yeah, I think it's, it's a match made in bad. heaven. And if you are a Baltimore Ravens team that is trying to find a way to make sure your offense doesn't sputter at home in an AFC championship game, again, having Derrick Henry on your sideline is going to be, a helpful tool to make sure that doesn't happen. I think that's the one that makes the most sense. Again, Derrick Henry could find his home in a couple places, but that's the one I think that's the best for the headlines. It's best for us, you know, going into the season. I think he is a, would be a real difference maker in Baltimore. I could absolutely see that. That is, uh, you know, the, the number one spot that most are projecting him to go to, and it would be a perfect fit. It does. It, it matches the physicality, like the style of play. I agree is the, yeah. is the thing where it's, the, that's the most, you know, fitting and the fact to your point that he can handle a, a, a load that is going to be required in Baltimore because they just haven't been able to find that health at that position. I mean, they, I, I think I can name six running backs that they have right now. That's the only <laughs> thing is like, who are they going to have to get? They're going to have to move off of some guys. Keaton Mitchell, before he got injured last year, he was looking was good, a but... rising rookie where you're like, Oh my gosh, like they got, and now him. he but would it, be a good compliment. Next JK Dobbins, you know, you know, Mitchell if, every year. If, once his ACL is healthy, would be a good compliment to yes. Derrick Henry. Definitely. So Definitely. I think Keon Mitchell is a guy you, you try to make sure he's healthy to go. You draft someone in the third, fourth, fifth round, who's just an all-around back who you could kind of like replace Gus Edwards with, who could block, who can catch, you know, a, a solid three-down back, and then you just go sign Derrick Henry with the hopes that you you can get one more 1,500-yard season out of Derrick Henry on your way to another AFC North, you know, title. That would be epic, man. The Baltimore Ravens would be a, a huge force to be reckoned with. Let's go back to Chicago. Jalen Johnson, top yeah. cornerback, uh, you know, by by many accounts on the market. Obviously, Legereus Sneed among that group, but Jalen Johnson, a very talented corner. Uh, I know a lot of reports are are indicating that you know the Bears are are wanting him back and and they're trying to get that deal, you know, done and in place. It does seem like the best fit for him. There's a lot of teams that could use cornerback help. Of course, that's a that's a premium position. If it's not Chicago, which to me, like he should go back to Chicago and 
I think it's great. Yeah. Lost the Chargers for me seems like a, another spot because they've been a team that's really been chasing that cornerback position and spending yep. a lot of money at it. But he's like they've been spending a lot of money for guys that were just a little bit older, right? You know, just outside of their prime. Jalen is entering. Jalen's a guy where, yeah, like you know, you're going to get ROI on this. You're you're going to get the return on investment for Jalen Johnson. So yeah. You know, if I'm the Chargers, whose defense really, really needs to to be overhauled in many ways, uh, John Harbaugh would certainly like to have him some Jalen Johnson there. But I will say again, like Chicago, you got to find a way to keep that guy there because he's a super talent and it's hard to find elite corners in this league. Absolutely. He's he's not leaving Chicago. They'll tag him or sign him. He's he's not going to leave. But if he does leave, look for the teams that are willing to spend on defense. So teams that historically value defense and are willing to spend. I give you another name that's got some cap space opening up. That would be New England, kind of pairing mm -hmm. him with Gonzalez yep. who they drafted last year in the top of the far, first round. So just teams that are I, willing I wouldn't mind to, Pittsburgh. Uh, him and Pittsburgh, Joey Porter yeah, teams, Jr. would be a great duo. Teams that are willing like to spend money historically on defense because he's going to re – he'll be a – either the number one paid corner or, you know, right there, top three, like he might reset the market. And so um, I think it'll get done in Chicago and I'm okay. Resetting the market with a guy like Jalen Johnson. Cause sure. we already know at this point in time, you're not paying your quarterback at minimum for at least two years in Chicago with whatever direction they go. Would you prefer a franchise tag or a long-term? No, just get a deal. Got deal. it done. Just get yeah. it done. Cause I want yeah. him. I want him committed Again, this Bears team... You want him a part of this next iteration of Chicago. No matter what the Bears do at quarterback, next year they have got to they have got to make a wild card or be right there until the final game. Like, they can't have it even to where it's this year to where, oh, you kind of... It was a turnaround. Like, they have got to be an, a nine-win team. An eight, or if they have a rookie quarterback, they could be an eight- or seven-win team, but you got to see, like, you know, real improvement. And part of that is going to be Ibraflus and his defense building on the, the late success in the season last year. So you cannot let Jalen Johnson go anywhere. He, you've got a homegrown talent. Remember, the Bears took a flyer on him because he was injured coming out of school, and he would have been a first-rounder if he wasn't injured. So it's like you're, you're seeing what they saw, and it's paying off. So now pay the guy. Sucks, but again, you're not paying your quarterback. If you pay your elite pass rusher in sweat, you pay your elite corner – you have a you you paid the middle linebacker positions. You're set. Like your defense is now set and paid for. Fill it with rookies and young guys, and then uh, and then focus on building up that offense. I like it. Yep, absolutely. I am in uh, agreement with you there. Uh, let's go to the best edge rusher in this class, Brian Burns. Uh, yeah. Dominant, dominant player. Obviously, Carolina had their opportunity. We've talked about it on the show uh, a couple weeks ago. How Carolina had the opportunity to get multiple firsts for Brian Burns just a couple years ago. And so to come around here where he's a free agent and potentially lose him for nothing seems like just a huge no, no. So if you're Carolina, it's almost like to, to save face, you just got to sign this guy and keep him there. Obviously he's a, he's a superb talent in its own right. So if you're a, a, a team like the Panthers, you don't want to keep getting worse. You want to start getting better. Yeah. And Brian Burns is a big part of that. So for the Carolina Panthers, it's a no-brainer. Find a way to get the deal done. For Brian Burns, the writing's on the wall. Like, Carolina's not going to be good for a couple more years, at a minimum, it seems. They've got a lot to do uh, to get back to relevance. And so if I'm Brian Burns, you know, I'm, I'm you know, tossing around the idea of, you know, Atlanta being a, being a decent fit, like going to a new regime, kind of starting fresh. Raheem Morris is a, is a defensive-minded head coach and a defensive guru in many ways. You have so much talent on offense. It'd be an intriguing spot. You get to stay in division, still compete for that number one spot in the NFC South. Yeah. Uh, but then, I, you know, if, if we're talking about, like you said, you know, some of the uh, the teams that have been willing to spend a lot of money, a uh, Rams would be a very interesting spot, I think, for, for a guy like Brian Burns because it's a team that is ready to win now that has had issues on the defensive side but still – have some studs and uh and and have you know some guys that you can have some confidence in uh or I don't know man if Vegas is an intriguing spot to have him paired with Matt paired up Crosby with and you'd almost instantly 
uh, fix the any any of those front seven issues for uh, the the Vegas Raiders. Yeah. There, I mean, there's but, a know, ton there's a of destinations. Of, I mean, anywhere yeah, who, who needs yeah. the bear, I'd love them on the star. Bears. I mean, I, you know, you put them with Montez Sweat, boom, like to go. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of that is there. I mean, there's a fit in almost every place. The problem will be, will he actually hit the market? If you're Carolina at this point in time, it feels like your hands are tied. You cannot let him hit the market because you will just be eviscerated from not only your own fans, but just other NFL GMs. People like, you're such a joke of an organization that if you weren't going to throw the bag at your best player, then you should have traded your best player because you could have got multiple high-end picks for him and he didn't do it. And so they'll they'll make the deal to get him to get him back. I think eventually. And if you're Brian Burns, listen, you don't have to be. Julius Peppers proved it. Other guys have proved it. like you don't have to be in New York as an edge rusher to end up being a Hall of Famer and all time great, right? Yeah. Go get your money, stay where you're at, and and yeah, I mean, if you're not part of a winning culture in the next year or two. Hopefully you can be part of when it turns around and you're going to be getting a ton of credit for that while also having so much money while living in a gorgeous, awesome city like Charlotte. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So you, if you're Brian Burns, you're going to be making so much money. You kind of win either way in this situation. Yeah. Uh, let's go to two wide receivers here. Michael Pittman Jr. and Kelvin Ridley. Two different parts of their career. Ridley his first year back in his return to action after a year long suspension, uh, a little bit underwhelming, uh, you know, yeah. debut with the Jaguars, obviously he had some huge games, but he had a lot of duds in there too, with Trevor Lawrence. To me, the best fit for Calvin Ridley is to stay in Jacksonville and keep developing that relationship because going to a third team in, you know, three years of gameplay yeah. uh, wouldn't be ideal for a 28 year old wide receiver. Uh, who's still trying to, you know, make top dollar. I think his best bet is to bl- like have a huge year, uh, second year developed with with Trevor Lawrence and hopefully get that offense back on track. And he could explode because we've seen it even last year in some games where he went off for 12 catches, 150 yards and a couple touchdowns. For Michael Pittman Jr., I think staying would be super, you know, beneficial. Obviously, you're the number one guy guaranteed. You're going to get the targets. You have a healthy run game. And you have a quarterback with a huge arm. Uh, but, you know, it, there's a lot of question marks surrounding that that passing game and what's going to go on with Indy. You like Shane Steich and all of that. They, there's obviously a lot to like, uh, but there are questions at the quarterback position. So if I were to posit um, a couple other options, I'll go back to the Chargers because this is a team that has had so many wide receiver health issues. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, maybe you're not going to be the number one. It's still Keenan Allen's job there. Uh, but what a pairing. You know, I don't know how they feel about Quentin Johnston because obviously he didn't have a very good rookie year. Um, do you just go and get a guy like like Michael Pittman to kind of patch that up and just have your starting three locked in place? Um, he would obviously be a fit in a lot of places and, and do really well. Uh, I think your Chicago Bears would be a really nice spot for him. He's he would complement DJ Moore's style very well, uh, be a true X receiver on the outside. Um, but I think the most likely scenario here is that Indianapolis is going to either tag him or resign him. And the same goes for Ridley. I think he's coming back to Jacksonville. But hey, maybe what if they swapped? You know what? Jacksonville could use Michael Pittman Jr. That wouldn't the, hurt. I will say this. The wide receivers like this have to be a little careful in the sense that there are so much talent in the wide receiver world yeah. now, yeah, and it comes true. out of the draft every single year. I mean, they're already talking about having another five wide receivers in the first round this year. I mean, so they're becoming a little bit of a dime a dozen. Go find your guy. Puka Nakua was a fifth-round pick. Like, you go find your guy and turn him into a star. And so if your offer, you feel like, well, that's pathetic. I'm worth more than that. Be careful what you wish for. I mean, look right. what happened to how quickly guys like Juju Smith-Schuster, they fall off the face of the earth. So if you're Michael Pittman and you have a nice offer to stay in Indy and be the number one guy, I would take it. If not, I think he would command more on the open market. Like him in uh, Kansas City with Rice Ooh. as the two, like that's a great, that's a dream. Can, cannot let that happen. That's a dream matchup if you're, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so Ridley, on the other hand, is a guy that I agree staying in Jacksonville is probably the smartest thing for him to do. 
But I again, he's the guy I worry about, like thinking, oh, I'm going to test the market. I'm worth more than this. And it's just like a lot of crickets because yeah, for those guys, it's really important to get a deal done before the draft because after the draft, everyone's going to draft wide receivers, everyone. And everyone wants to get those new shiny toys into camp and be like, what do we got here? We're not paying you a dime. And can you go put up giant numbers? Like Pittsburgh is good at finding those wide receivers that do that. So be careful what you wish for. That big money might not be there. Take that guarantees what you can and find those deals. Staying, I think, is the best fit for both of them. But Michael Pittman Jr. certainly has a bigger market, in my opinion. Yeah, no, that's that's. I wouldn't fair. overpay for Michael Pittman Jr. though either. Like I'm not, I'm yeah. not willing to give him, you know, fifty, sixty million, like guaranteed in that in that realm, unless it's over a a longer period. He's had some injury problems, and again, I I just think wide receivers now are a position where, like, kind of like running back, you can find a good wide receiver. You can find someone in the draft if you if you trust your scouts. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the only benefit that wide receivers have is that you can be a star. Uh, you can have multiple stars on your team that excel. It's very hard to find two dominant running backs on one team and, and that produce True. in that way. True. Uh, so that's why wide receiver might take a little bit longer to fade out. But I agree with you. It's going to that bubble is going to burst at some point, just like the running back market did, because there were so many quality options in the draft. And even, you know, undrafted for that matter. Let's go to uh, three defensive linemen to round out our conversation here. Josh Allen of the Jaguars, Chris Jones uh, of the Kansas City Chiefs, and uh, Justin Matabuike uh, from the Baltimore Ravens. Now, I, for most of the players we've listed here today, outside of the running backs, we've thought that returning to the, their team is in the best interest of the team. Um, and in most of the cases, in the best interest of the player, too. I think that's probably the case yes. with these guys as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. But if if Kansas City isn't going to be happening for Chris Jones, which I, I start to think like we'll see kind of what they're planning to spend on wide receiver and if they're trying to to spend a lot, you know, there might be there this might be the a, a divorce that's you know pending. If that's the case, and it would suck for Kansas City fans. But I think Chris Jones going to Buffalo would be a huge, huge uh, asset God. to both Buffalo and for Chris Jones. You're in a very similar position where you have an offense that could really help bail you guys out. We know Chris Jones, you know, smartly, I'm not saying this pejoratively, wisely, you know, chooses his moments throughout the season of when he needs to come up big. We saw it in the Super Bowl, too. Yeah. Um. Buffalo is a place where you can do that. You can afford that because your offense is going to be scoring so many points. You don't need to be, oh, God, we need to get a stop at you. Like Pittsburgh's defense last year had to get a stop every time they're yeah, out there. Your offense field. is so bad. Um, so Buffalo would be in a fantastic spot. Or even maybe like a Detroit where uh, you know, now you go to a dome and you're with a Super Bowl comp uh, you know, competitor. Um, so, yeah, I, I think Chris Jones would be a great spot there and, and just a matter of week as well in those two spots, Buffalo or Detroit, I think would be great fits for them. But Baltimore, you have to find a way to to get Man Matabuike down. Like you've he's a homegrown yeah. kid. We've talked about it. Uh win now. You're in there. win now. I wouldn't I wouldn't kill Kansas City for not retaining Chris Jones, to be honest. Because he's he's a lot of money. He's getting older and and I get it. I get it. There's other there's other areas and they've shown before that they can win without superstars uh at other positions outside of quarterback so i wouldn't kill kansas city for it i would kill baltimore for it and for jacksonville you can't just you just can't afford to lose good defensive players period so that's my rationale for that yeah no josh allen is again homegrown and he's a very very good at rushing the passer and in the afc you cannot aff afford to lose a guy you can get after the quarterback i agree with baltimore same reasoning homegrown he's just now peaking and you've been paying him nothing, and now he's the anchor for uh, your defense. This was one of the top in the league, and again, you can't afford uh, to lose pieces to that if you're trying to win now, and the window is open now. And for Chris Jones, I agree. Chris Jones is one of those guys that, again, like Brian Burns, if he hits the market, there's not a bad spot for him because he's going to be getting paid. He doesn't have any pressure to win. He's already got his rings, and he will instantly make that team better. 
But the smartest thing in the world to do if you're Kansas City is to stay there. And if I was Chris Jones, at this point, I probably would take a little bit of a pay cut to stay in Kansas City. Life has been good. You've been eaten. And your, your chance to be a Hall of Famer stays higher if you stay in Kansas City. If all of a sudden you go yeah. and take way more money and just disappear in Indianapolis for the next three years, am I going to be like, oh, Chris Jones, is he a Hall of Famer? Is he not? What are his stats like? Where does he line up? But if you stay in Kansas City and you're playing in big moments, have another big sack and a big game for a Super Bowl and you know win another ring, like then yeah, the dude's like an easy in our heads, like, oh, that guy's a Hall of Famer. Even if his yeah. stats aren't Aaron Donald, like you know, so and I'm curious to see which route he goes because yeah. you know last year we did see him say I'm willing to you know sit out for to get my bag, uh, but he did eventually. I'm wondering if this year maybe he's taking a different approach of saying, okay, this is more about legacy for me now. I want to get another ring. I want to move forward with this dynasty. So that's a good point because that is a motivating factor for a lot of guys, even if they are more and more so uh, inclined to to constantly break records yeah. and break the bank you know guys made a lot of money maybe he is willing to take a slight home di- hometown discount absolutely uh, to win another title absolutely yeah. all right i have one more name i want to throw at you from uh, that wasn't on Let's our list it. and i just yeah. thought to myself this is one of those it, it probably it's not as big of an it's not as big of like a maybe a signing if you know if if, if a mike evans had gone somewhere or kirk cousins signs but this is a team that again, I just think they are they they have to look to find ways to add unique pieces on one year deals that keep them at the top of the mountain. The Kansas City Chiefs. If I were to tell you this name signs of the Kansas City Chiefs, your reaction would be probably like my reaction would be like, oh shit, that damn, that's that sucks. They're gonna be so good. Like they're gonna find a way to make that work really, really well. And that name is Austin Eckler. Like they have Isaiah Pacheco, right? Uh, Clyde Edwards Alaire is a free agent. I think you bring back Alaire if you can on a nice deal as a good compliment to Pacheco. But if you can get an Austin Eckler on like a one year deal that is very much like a prove it Austin Eckler and like come win a Super Bowl, just think of him in Andy Reid's system. Like that's going to annoy oh, yeah. the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> like, that, that's going to be one of those you're like, how? Why? Why did we give him? Now, why did they get him and that tool? And he won't be a chief for life. It'll be like a one year, and then he, he wins the Super Bowl, and he's gone. They're going to squeeze all the juice out of him. But as a nice compliment to Pacheco, like Austin Eckler doing weird, crazy routes in the backfield and all of a sudden catching shovel passes, no look, and you just be like, why? Why did we let the Chiefs get Austin Eckler? That would be an epic signing, and especially because, man, just watching him go in motion in that offense, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they probably would, he would probably be used much more as like a slot uh, gadget type of player, almost oh, yeah. in a Debo Samuel style uh, role, and that would be terrifying. You so, know, he's yeah, 30, and you. he's and it, wild. And I don't think he's going to get the money. Last year was his real chance to try to right. get the money. Yeah. I think he's if he's smart, he knows now the best thing he can do is to take like a one year deal where he could go win and it like and and try to keep his name alive as someone uh, in that world and I think doing it in Kansas City as opposed to disappearing on some bad you know Carolina team just because they're giving you an extra million dollars don't do it sure sure absolutely no definitely agree with you there that would be an epic signing for sure I'm I, yeah I I he was not on my radar so that was uh, I'm glad you're able to pull that out of the hat there. Another one I will just say, can A.J. Dillon go to Buffalo, please? I mean, if we're talking about fit, yeah. That, because that be I sense. want him I want him out of Green Bay. I'm sick and yeah. tired of his giant ass running down the Bears yeah. all every Sunday. And and he would be a great fit, a great compliment to Cooks. Cooks, it, uh, Cook is a lot like, um, you know, Jones. And I think yep. he'd just be a, in Buffalo. They were, they were running the ball late in the year. Get him on a nice two-year deal. To just go up in there in the snow and the cold and be a, a just a bruising back as a compliment with Josh Allen in that run game, I think uh, AJ Dillon in Buffalo makes a lot of sense. Would give them a goal line option outside of Josh Allen as well. Yes. So you get to get to maybe uh, maybe give him a rest every now and then inside the ten yard line. All right, that's been our free agency landing spots episode. Remember, free agency begins next week. I'm sure we'll have stuff to discuss then. Uh, as we get more news rolling in, franchise tax still 
uh, available for the next 24 hours. So maybe we'll see some of these guys already off the board. Uh, and then after that, uh, we're we're all into draft mode. We got a month uh, after that point uh, to discuss draft uh, before we get to the 2024 NFL draft selection. So be tuned, uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, and as always, we'll see you back here next time on the Football Lounge with Mark and Dan. Mm-hmm.